Yeah. And he thinks I have a speech prepared, although I was only asked five minutes ago if I would do this presentation. So uh, I see familiar faces and some new faces and some that are familiar that I don't remember the names. But anyway, it's great to see everybody and it's great to have Kenny back here. Um, I first met Kenny, I'm trying to think of something awful to say or something really funny. <laughs> but even though we laughed a lot over the years, uh, we really didn't meet until he began, got in, into the newspaper work, and I was the editor of the paper, and we transitioned over to all the three, four, how many other papers that were going on at the time, and and uh, Kenny was instrumental in, in um, that transition, and, and he's done nothing but uh, reward us all since. I'd like to personally say a couple things here, well, it's all personal to me. Um, what Kenny's written about is really important to, to me personally. I think that a number of you I know were involved in, in, in many of the things that Kenny was involved in and writes about, but there's a part of our history that is positive. We often hear stuff about the negative parts of our history, and I'm talking mostly about the 60s and 70s here, but Kenny has incorporated a lot of the positives. The love that was there, the joy, the incredible intelligence, um, the conversations that we had, I often joke about having conversations for four days with people coming and going and talking about how the world started with, oh, I guess I shouldn't say that it's a video, but anyway, um, <laughs> it ended in the same thing, um, and the players, you know, and, and so many of them have gone on and, uh, and left us, unfortunately, but we still have a history, and, and I thank Kenny for keeping that alive. We need that, and he's added to it by his, his own skills and ability and um, good-natured senses. Um, I also do want to say that uh, Kenny, I just found out, and that's what's written here because my little inside source, Scott, um, has uh, told me that you were recently um, nominated for the Pros Awards, and which annually recognize the very best in professional and scholarly publishing by bringing attention to distinguished books, journals, and electronic content in over 40 categories. So congratulations. They're judged by peer publishers librarians, and medical professionals since 1976. Their prose awards are extraordinary for their breadth and depth, which is amazing. <laughs> um, each year, publishers and authors are recognized at the annual conference in Washington, D.C. for their commitment to primary works of research and for contributing to the conception, production, and design of landmark works in their fields. So that's fabulous. And one more thing on the old folks here. I'm older than Kenny, but um, my, I have younger kids who aren't young anymore, and you all may have, and you know, grandchildren and everything else. But part of that history to me was um, whether you like Obama or not, the fact that we had an African American president, a black president, yes. get elected a number of years ago was an amazing thing. And I was walking in the Congressional Cemetery dog walking park with my kid, and he said, Mom, we couldn't have done that if you all hadn't done all that you did. So, and that was just a piece of it. So I think our, um, there's a part of our next generation that, that knows what we did, and you've kept that alive, and I think that you'll keep that alive for a lot of years, because you can read your stuff. It's not like, oh my God, another so. You know, so <laughs> thank you for that, and uh, many more books to come. Thanks so much. Maggie Hackett, one of the uh, the pioneers of the left in, in the Lansing area. Uh, and also one of the, uh, has to be a good friend, only my best friends get to call me Kenny. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. But uh, so thanks, Maggie. Uh, and thanks everybody for showing up. It's great seeing you all again. Uh, I've seen a number of you here for two or more times, actually. This is the, uh, the fourth talk that I'm giving on my, uh, my Voices from the Underground series. The first three of them were next door and everybody reads. Uh, so today we just changed the venue and brought it over to, uh, to uh, Avenue Cafe. So thanks for Avenue Cafe for sponsoring, for hosting this event. And thanks to the Peace Education Center for sponsoring this event. You guys are incredible. Uh, I can't believe you guys are still around after this many years. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. Definitely. Still, still a lot of about peace around there. There you go. Well, I went to my first peace education center event. It had to be over 40 years ago. I can't remember what it was. I'm sure it was a meeting of some kind. <laughs> <laughs> An organizational meeting or a seminar or 
conference, but I know it was fun. It was educational teaching. <laughs> teaching. There you go. But it was great. And uh, and also thanks to uh, to the cafe here, Avenue Cafe, for providing a, a real nice food spread. Uh, always. Always nice to begin an event with good food. So who remembers the potluck dinners from the 70s here? Okay, everyone would bring a dish to pass. We'd feast all night, we'd party, we'd dance, we'd sing, and we organized against the war. There's no way we were going to lose. It was just, just having too much fun. So tonight, I'm really, it's a really special evening tonight. Uh, first of all, this is the fourth talk that I'm giving, like I said. Uh, but, uh, you know, the fourth book. But... This is the last talk. That's what really kind of makes this special. Um, it was a 25-year project. Uh, hard to believe that, but 25 years from when I conceptualized uh, the first edition to the time when volume four of the second edition actually appeared. 25 years. Uh, so it's hard to believe that. But uh, tonight's a special evening for another reason also, because later on tonight I'm going to be introducing Scott Harris. Uh, a man who has brought this community a special gift, a real special gift. And uh, so we're here to pay tribute to Scott. And uh, I hope some of you will join Scott and me up here later on when we get to that point in the evening. So volume four, um, volume four, Stop the Presses, I Want to Get Off is the name of it. Uh, this is Joe Grant's story of how he came to publish uh, Prisoner's Digest International or Penal Digest International, as it was called originally, the, uh, the premier, the most important prisoner's rights underground newspaper of the Vietnam era, and quite possibly of all time. It was an amazing paper, and uh, it was my incredible good fortune to be Joe's editor. Uh, anybody here believe in predestination? Anybody? Beshert, as we say in Yiddish. Uh, Beshert, it was meant to be. Uh, I, I didn't used to believe in it, but, but since I started editing the series, I've come to believe that there may be some truth to, to the whole predestination thing. I just, I, I don't know, sometimes I think that somewhere between day six and day seven, God looked down at me and he said, he's going to cover the underground press. <laughs> I, I, I just always seem to be at the right place at the right time. Uh, certainly that was the story of how I, I got uh, to, my, I met Joe and the, and the Penal Digest folks. Um, and it began with a woman. I, I know it's a little embarrassed to say that. Uh, it's a cliche. It's corny. But there's no other way to say it. Uh, I broke up with a woman. I fell into my woe is me state of mind. And, and I did what I always did in the early 70s when I was depressed or, or restless. I hit the road. Uh, I went uh, first to Madison, Wisconsin, which was the Midwest radical hotbed of the, uh, the period. And then from there, I went to uh, Boulder, Colorado, which was the home at the time of my all-time oldest friend who was going to school out there. I traveled via my usual mode of transportation, my thumb. <laughs> and so on this particular day, I was hitching west on I-80 from Madison to Boulder, and I got let off in Iowa City. Before I had time to recharge my thumb, a car pulled over, Two guys were sitting in the front seat. The guy sitting shotgun rolled down the window and he called out, where are you headed? I said, Boulder. He said, you hungry? Well, I was, but I didn't give hunger a lot of thought in those days. I fed off the exhilaration of being on the road, of traveling whichever way the wind blew, of, of waving the shopping bag that revealed my destination so seductively <laughs> while always giving direct eye contact <laughs> that drivers in oncoming cars had no choice but to either pull over and give me a ride or else pass me up anyhow. But if they passed me up, they knew that I knew that they knew that I was standing there. <laughs> and so they felt guilty. And that was kind of a consolation prize. Get a little, uh, get a ride or you invoke guilt, one way or the other. So, and if none of that worked to satisfy my hunger, I always had a bag of raisins with me. It lasted forever, it never went bad, didn't cost a lot, and you could stuff it into any pocket of air in your, in your backpack. Anyhow, the guy sitting shotgun opened up the back door, I hopped in, 
and they drove me to 505 South Lucas, which was their home and their office. On the way to 505, as they called it, they explained to me that they were ex-cons and that they worked on a paper called Penal Digest International. Was that Colorado or, or Wisconsin? This was in Iowa City. Oh, oh. I was midway between the... Okay. So, uh, and they worked on a paper called Penal Digest International, or PDI. I never heard of Penal Digest International because it wasn't a member of Underground Press Syndicate, the first nationwide network of underground papers, including Joint Issue, the paper that I worked on here in Lansing. But I certainly was intrigued by a paper put out by ex-cons and whose reporters covered their respective beats in Folsom and San Quentin and Attica and Leavenworth and other papers, other uh, jails and prisons around the country. They spoke excitedly about the newspaper, but they became even more passionate when they, ex they told me about the birth of the newest member of their collective, a little girl who had been born in an in-home ceremony just a month before, uh, in a, a ceremony that, that featured music in the background and a hash pipe circulating <laughs> around the room in the foreground. <laughs> I was treated warmly by everybody at 505, and I enjoyed a delicious vegetarian dinner. While I was waiting for dinner to be served, I noticed a light table in the, in the back room. I figured that was the office, so I went over to take a look. A partially laid out page was on the light table. So I began to read it, just to get a preview of the upcoming issue. Wouldn't you know it, I discovered a typographical error. <laughs> well, being the compulsive anal retentive that I was back then, and <laughs> Emily's laughing, and am still, okay. Uh, I had no choice but to correct it. Fortunately, there was a, uh, a desk next to the light table, and there was a typewriter on the desk, and there was a piece of paper in the typewriter. So I typed over the word correctly, and then I cut it out with the scissors, trimming away as much of the white space around the letters as I could. Then I picked up the correctly spelled word with the tweezers, lightly dabbed the back of it with glue stick, and then carefully laid it over the incorrectly spelled word using the light that streamed in through the back of the page from the light table to help me line it up accurately with the other words on that line. And that was it. I felt a whole lot better. The rest of the evening was great because <laughs> I had that taken care of. I can't remember if I spent the night there or if they drove me back to the freeway. I can't remember right away, but I know that the whole experience left a major impression on me. Uh, I wrote a letter back to the Joint Issue folks and they published it. Sixteen years later, sixteen years later, I was beginning to conceptualize the first edition of Voices from the Underground. And I knew that I wanted Penal Digest to be one of the stories. Fortunately, the Special Collections Library here at Michigan State had copies of Penal Digest. And the General Library upstairs had an impressive phone book collection. Uh, I think it was one of the largest in the country back then, and it included Iowa City. So I perused a number of back issues, compiled a list of names, co complete names, not just first names or nicknames or pseudonyms or, or you know, aliases. <laughs> and, uh, and then I looked them up in the phone book, hoping to find a match. Fortunately, I found one. So I called her up. And I asked her if she'd written or she'd been part of Penal Digest International in the early 70s. When she said she had, I began to explain the project that I was working on. I said what I was looking for was an insider, somebody who had been a key person on the paper who could put together a comprehensive history of the, of the newspaper for a, an anthology that I was compiling of other histories. To burnish my PDI credentials, I told her about the whole experience of hitchhiking on, uh, on I-80 and about the, the two ex-cons and the, the baby being born in the hash pipe, the whole thing. Unfortunately, unfortunately, she wasn't the right person to write the piece. So I said, who do I need to talk to? She said, you need to talk to Joe Grant. I said, can you give me his phone number? She said, no. 
But she said, if you give me your phone number, I'll pass it on to Joe and tell him to give you a call. So I mustered up all the excitement I could get, come up with, and I said, great, thanks so much. But as I hung up the phone, I said to myself, well, you can kiss that one goodbye. Because honestly speaking, how often when people say they're going to call you back, do they really call you back? <laughs> well, two weeks later, Joe called me back. It turned out that he hadn't been in Iowa City the day that I passed through, but apparently I'd made such an impression on everybody that they told him all about me when they returned. He said, Ken, over the years when we were publishing PDI, lots and lots of people came through town. They ate our food, they drank our booze, they smoked our dope, they, they spent the night, they partied with us. He said, but of all those people, of all those people, you were the only one, the only one to voluntarily work on the paper <laughs> without being asked. <laughs> he, he said over the years, uh, you know, since then, a number of people had asked him to write his story. And he always said no. But to me, he said yes. It was all because I'd corrected a typo. <laughs> So there's a lesson for all you anal retentives out there. <laughs> Put, <laughs> Put that on your resume. There's a job waiting for you somewhere. So, but uh, over the next year and a half, Joe and I developed a, a close working relationship and a, a strong friendship that actually continues to this day. Uh, as he dove into the task of, of writing his story and I dove into the task of editing his story. By the time we were done, it was one of the longest two pieces in the, in the book. The book, uh, when it came out, it was a huge book. It was over 600 pages, laid out in an eight and a half by 11 two column format. Literally the equivalent of four books, it really was. And I knew Joe's book should have been, his story should have been its own book. It really should have been. So now it is. Uh, it's been updated, it's been expanded, and uh, a number of the errors that crept in that first edition have been corrected. Uh, and what a story he tells. What an amazing story. Joe was the, the oldest one of all of the contributors. All the rest of us were in our coming of age years. We were in our 20s, maybe early, middle, late, somewhere along the way, but all of us were in our 20s. Joe, Joe's story begins in 1953. Okay, ours begin during the 60s and 70s. His begins in 1953 when a lot of us were in preschool and he was in pre-revolutionary Cuba, serving in the U.S. Navy. Uh, one day when he was out on leave, he ran into a couple, uh, you know, group of people who were revolutionaries, and he befriended them. So that's how his story starts. Uh, it takes us through the years when he was uh, publishing a rank-and-file labor newspaper, and then it takes us into the mid-60s, when he got busted for counterfeiting and got thrown into Leavenworth. Prison during those days was a hellhole, but there was a certain spirit of rebellion in the air. Uh, there was a, a certain segment of society that believed that if we rehabilitated prisoners rather than punishing them, that when they were released from prison, they could return to society as well-adjusted individuals rather than as hardened criminals who were going to end up back in prison. So that was the, the theory and that was the, the practice. They tried to do that. And so there were, there were efforts then to provide vocational classes and to modernize libraries and to expand uh, visiting hours and to, uh, to improve the quality of health care and food and to uh, recognize religious freedom and to not open mail. Little things like that. But prisoners were picking up on this whole spirit of rebellion that was happening in the streets. And so they were beginning to dissolve the, the uh, differences that separated them from each other based on race and religion. And they were beginning to unite with prisoners, you know, inmates in other prisons uh, around common causes. So this was the atmosphere uh, that Joe was facing when he began to conceptualize his own ideas for Prisoner's Digest International, a paper that had two goals, two purposes. One was 
to, uh, to provide a voice for prisoners that the authorities could not silence. And the other was to create a, a link between prisoners and the outside world. So the first issue came out in 1971. Uh, in the brief history, they did a lot more than just print uh, news stories and poems. In the best tradition of the underground press, uh, they also created the news. Okay, so they, and then they reported on them. So they, they uh, prevented the extradition of an Arkansas escapee. They uh, helped to facilitate the release from prison of an Indian boy who had already spent six years in prison for a crime he never even committed. Uh, they they uh, exposed the behavior modification experiments that were being performed illegally on prisoners. And they did this actually by publishing insider stories written by the prisoners who had survived these experiments. Uh, they, uh, they tracked and, and they reported on the uh, successes and the ongoing challenges of the uh, jailhouse lawyers. And they, um, they were outside the walls of Attica, actually, before the massacre, doing their best to prevent the massacre. They were encouraging uh, negotiations. Unfortunately, as we all know, they, they didn't succeed there, but that, that was their role as activists. They were out there trying. Uh, Joe happens to be a, a master storyteller. Uh, what you get in, in, in the book is uh, his story of the first and probably only underground newspaper that ever took place inside Leavenworth. Uh, it was, it was uh, published right under the noses of the guards. Uh, and Joe, of course, was the instigator behind it. So he instigated it. Years later, he writes about it. Uh, he tells about uh, the financing that, that uh, he received for PDI from uh, Jimmy Hoffa, the legendary Teamster leader. Uh, and at another time, he got uh, financing from Playboy magazine. Um, he, uh, he introduces us to, uh, to all the characters. There's so many characters that, sur that uh, revolved around 505, uh, the, uh, the community people, the, the kids. The, there are lots of kids who play major parts in this story. Uh, the ex-cons, you know, as, as uh, they got out of prison, a lot of people, a lot of the ex-cons came to Iowa City and they, they would live with, uh, with the staff and work on the paper. And then there were the, the visitors from out of town who came through, including one who I'm sure about every one of you knows, but you're not going to recognize the name. Who remembers Jerry Samuels? Anybody? No hands are going up. What about Napoleon the 14th? Anybody? They're coming to take me away. Ha ha he he. Oh, that was Jerry Samuels writing under the name of Napoleon the 14th. And uh, he, he spent time at, uh, at 505. So there's, a, there's a, a story in there all about him. Very funny. He also wrote a couple songs that he gave over to Joe. The, the lyrics are in the book. So, and then there's one other story. There are a lot of other stories, but there's one in particular. Uh, it's a very poignant story. And again, there are a lot of poignant stories in here. But this one is special because it's about Joe's mother, uh, his beloved mother. He really adored her. But in reading this story, this part of the story, which is a tribute to his mother, what you're also going to learn for the first time is how legendary singer Peggy Lee got her name. Really interesting story. You've got to read this. This was a story that did not appear in the first edition. Uh, we were fighting deadlines to get that done, so Joe, uh, you know, he wanted to tell it, but he didn't have time to tell it. In this version, which we had a little more time to work on, he's got it in there. So it's a really wonderful story about how Peggy Lee got her name. Uh, and there's a whole lot more. But the last issue came out in uh, 1974. Naturally, as you might guess, police harassment played its role. But so did uh, just good old-fashioned burnout. I mean, it was a, it was a long, pretty hectic uh, period, those three years. Uh, the um, prison conditions are a lot worse now, actually, than they were then. A lot worse now. Uh, th the whole concept of rehabilitation has given way to private, uh, for-profit ownership and punishment as the guiding forces behind the prisons. So it's fortunate that there are some papers now 
uh, including one of the best, which is Prison Legal News. Uh, and the publisher of Prison Legal News, himself an ex-con, is Paul Wright, and he wrote the afterword to the book. So I'm really honored to have his piece in there. The foreword is written by arguably the most famous political prisoner in the world, uh, former Black Panther Mumia Abu-Jamal. Uh, getting in touch with uh, a prisoner on death row is, is a real logistical challenge that involves uh, patience, persistence, a uh, little bit of uh, a little incredible networking, and a little bit of luck. Or, or again, maybe Bashert. Uh, maybe, who knows? But, uh, but I did track down Mumia, and I was able to send him a, a copy of the manuscript. Uh, he read the book. He loved the book. Uh, let, let me just read you what he said, because I'm impressed with it. Uh, he said, It would be sheer understatement for, for me to praise Joe Grant's prison bio as groundbreaking, moving, or eye-opening. It is all these things, but certainly much more. This is journalism of a kind that never, I'm trying to read it through the dark here, uh, that never made it into the, the school, um, into the curriculum of J school. This ain't your grandmama's New York Times. This is the real stuff. Grant gives us all a bird's eye view of how prisons ran during the 60s and 70s and gives us a glimpse of what might have been before the prison reform movement fell into the hands, uh, the black hole of the corrections industry and the culture of mass fear emerged. So real, real nice. And he says a lot more. That's just an excerpt. But, uh, but he loved the book. Um, only a few months after Mumia submitted his piece, you know, he was uh, a few months after he submitted, like two or three months after he submitted, he was released from from uh, solitary, from you know, from the death row, from prison, you know, death row for the first time in 29 years. Uh, I mean, that's really hard to imagine. Um, 29 years. I really liked the kid that it was, you know, because of me that he got out. But uh, but seriously speaking, it was only because of a uh, concentrated worldwide movement uh, to free Mumia. Uh, he's now in the uh, in the main, you know, in the in the, the general population in a Pennsylvania prison. But the, the ongoing mistreatment of Mumia uh, really is a testament to his, uh, his, his role as a, a voice for the oppressed, a brilliant. Uh, he wrote his master's dissertation while he was in prison, in solitary. I mean, really, really amazing guy. Um, and, and so I'd like to, to end this, this brief uh, discussion with two calls to action. Two calls to action. And the first one is free Mumia. Okay? And the second one is, stop the presses, I want to get off. Not free either, but buy it. Okay? Uh, all proceeds tonight are going to Everybody Reads. So we're, we're here uh, to support the bookstore. So I hope you're going to uh, get copies of that. Thank you. <laughs>